I'm presenting uh, universal payment channels. It is, uh, it's a payment channel implementation I'm working on. And payment channels are a related technology to Interledger, very similar actually. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get some payment channel functionality into Interledger. Um, but this is the system I'm working on, a little bit different. So um, it's part of a larger project, Incentivize Mesh. Um, I'm not gonna really explain it fully, but I'm trying to build a network where routers uh, pay each other for forwarding packets. So each router is its own ISP. You can put an antenna on your roof and make money, this kind of thing. Um, this necessitates a very high volume of payments. Um, so you don't want to contact a ledger, you know, not necessarily for every single packet, but for small amounts of data. You don't want to be sending uh, messages to a bank or a ledger or a blockchain or something like that. It just can't scale. So uh, payment channels let you do payments directly between users. Um, so one packet payment is just one piece of information that goes one way and the payment is made. Um, I don't have time to explain it fully, so you can check my website, altheamesh.com. Um, it's based on the Lightning Channel, and there's also several other channel implementations in other cryptocurrencies now. Um, I'm trying to bring it outside of the cryptocurrency domain. Um, and in cryptocurrency, payment channels are especially uh, needed because the uh, blockchains are very slow, um, as Dimitri covered. So uh, that's why it comes from this space, I think. Um, it uses escrow, provided by a bank or a blockchain, and notes pay each other by exchanging side notes, and the ledger is not involved. And channels can also be combined for multi-top payments. So that, that lets you get the, you know, the interledger aspect of it. So in comparison to interledger, um, both can move value trustlessly. Um, Interledger holds the funds in escrow for the duration of one transaction. So the escrow is there to facilitate the transaction and make sure that nobody loses any money. Um, and the ledgers are contacted for every single transaction. So payment channels uh, are similar, but they hold the funds in escrow for longer. So instead of one transaction, they're held in escrow for a while. Um, <coughs> So then each payment that goes through is using the same escrow amount that doesn't contact the ledger, it doesn't add any load to the ledger. Uh, so I'm just going to explain it quickly uh, with some nice diagrams. I've actually on this slide labeled uh, this with interledger terms, and maybe I'll change the terms in my, in my white paper and code as well um, for consistency. But Alice and Bob here can both be considered connectors, and the ledger is a bank or a blockchain. So how it works is Alice and Bob, they go to the bank, and they each deposit $100 into an escrow account. And they say to the bank, um, give this money back to us uh, when you get a note that's signed by both of us. And this note is going to have updated amounts on it. So you can see they have initial deposits. Uh, they sign this, both it's you know, all certified and everything. Um, and so then Alice wants to pay Bob, and this is where the scalability happens. Alice is updating the amounts on the note or to, uh, to new balances for her and Bob. And so it's like she's paying him $5 because her balance is now 95 and his balance is $105. So of course the payments, they need to stay within the amount that's been placed in escrow. Um, she can't pay Bob, uh, you know, she can't pay Bob $1,000. So when Bob wants to close the channel, and this is when he wants to get his money out of the channel and have it back in his bank account or have it in cash hand or whatever it is, um, he sends another sign, he, he, he takes, so see, Alice has signed it, but Bob, Bob has not signed the note. Uh, when he would like to redeem his money, he signs it as well, and he gives it to the ledger. And the ledger pays the money out. That's the basic mechanism. Um, there is a way that Bob could cheat. Bob could keep an old note um, from when he had a higher balance and then give it to the ledger later and get money he's not supposed to have. So let's say, uh, Bob then pays Alice $10, and the balances are different. Bob could keep this one from before and get his money with this. <coughs> so to prevent that, you put a hold period and a sequence number on it. And uh, so the, when the bank of the blockchain gets this, they, they know they're not supposed to release the money um, until the hold period is over. And if during that hold period, they get a note that has a higher sequence number, um, than the one that they're currently waiting on, um, they, they honor them with a higher sequence number. So at each stage, Alice and Bob are agreeing to change the balances and increment the sequence numbers. They're agreeing on the content and the order of the transactions. 
Um, and so here you can see two days later, they get their money out in the, the correct amounts. Um, yes. So also they can put the hold period to none. If they both agree they want to close the channel, and that they skip, they don't have to wait at all. Um, so this is where uh, it becomes a little bit more like interledger. Uh, you could do other things, um, have, have different conditions. Um, so for instance, we have a condition here. If given the string that hashes to x, y, z, one, two, three, close this channel after two days, transferring these updated amounts back to Bob, or in fact, to Alice and Bob over here. So, to, so for Bob to get his money, he has to uh, he has to present the string that hashes to a certain hash, and it's called a hash lock. It's the base of Lightning Network. Um, so what what happens is that Alice gives Alice gives Charlie the secret, which hashes to X, Y, Z, one, two, three. She then makes a hash lock payment to Bob, and it says Bob should get this money, but he can't unlock it until he has a secret. And Bob makes a hash lock payment to Charlie. And um, so for Charlie to get his money from Bob, he has to show Bob the secret, at which point Bob um, you know, knows that he can <coughs> unlock the money. He could go to the bank and get the money out if he wanted to. And then Bob gives a secret to Alice and gets his money. And so this is like the interledger transfer mechanism. Um, but the ledger is not involved in this right here because it's under this, this initial escrow that's been in place and hold. Um, and actually, I should probably remove this slide. I always explain this before I show up here. See, it's, uh, you know, the secret goes back, the money goes forward. Um, also, it doesn't really matter, uh, just like interledger, it doesn't really matter what um, the individual, what value the inter individual ledgers are storing, as long as the money is still being released by the, you know, the same hash. Uh, you can go through BART and, with, and Conrad, who have a Dogecoin channel open um, on the way to giving Doris some dollars, for example. So implementation, uh, I, I made this presentation like about two months ago. Um, I was writing the white paper, and since then I have started uh, to implement the code, and I've also uh, learned some some new concepts um, involving state channels um, from the Martin Koppelman. There's, there's two people working on this stuff, uh, Zach Hess. So uh, I changed my code a bit. This gets a little bit more advanced here, um, but I've changed it to be state channels, and then the payment stuff can go on top of the state channel pretty easily. I'll show you how to do that in a second. So if you look at this, um, there, the peers are basically agreeing on a state. Um, so they're agreeing in the opening transaction on how much money they're each putting in. Of course, the ledger also needs to agree to this. And then they are agreeing also on how much money they want to transfer with each individual update transaction. The update transaction is the one that, um, you know, for the payments that goes back and forth a lot. And then you're also agreeing on hash locks, which is certain amounts of money that will be uh, released when receiving the secret that resolves this hash. And, you know, that's just an example. You could also have it uh, with signatures or, or other uh, conditions as well. Um, but that's a, that's a form of state. And the following transaction is um, change the secret. Uh, and that's also a form of state. So basically, um, if I'm getting this across clearly enough, but it's, it's uh, you just need to have a way for people to agree on an opening state then agree on update states, which have sequence numbers, you agree on the order of those. Um, and then also uh, the following transaction is not really core to it, but that lets you submit data afterwards. Uh, for instance, the secret that hashes to the right hash. Um, so, so that's what I'm doing now is, is state channels. And uh, this is a diagram of the, uh, the different parts of the software. Going. So I am writing right now this and this, and they're about 75% done. And so you have a peer, and this is running on the device of the person who's trying to make the payments, or the person, the entity. And the peer uh, it checks signatures and sequence numbers, and you know checks what checks that the, the sequence number is right for the, for the state. And the business logic, this is something that the developer writes. Um, it, it implements rules about that state. So for instance, that um, when you're getting some money, you, you don't want to end up with less money. You how do you only want more money? You know, you want a payment. You don't want to. So, uh, and then that you know this interface with user input and other systems as well. Uh, again, interledger terminology. This is a connector, uh, connector, and the ledger. Um, and so this the judge. It also checks the signatures and it 
talks to some business logic up here, which um, makes sure that the state is acceptable again. Um, so for instance, for an opening transaction with a bank, it would check uh, that, that each party has enough money in their account um, to even open the channel. Uh, to close out the channel, we just check that everything's valid and that none of the balances go below zero or anything like that. Um, and then this is the counterparty system. This is just like this, but it's over here, another person, uh, which is also connected. And uh, I haven't started work on this other part here yet, but um, a way for to work with uh, with blockchains. Um, and basically, you have a judge contract instead of having a instead of having a centralized judge system like here, you know, like out of bank. Um, a judge contract on the blockchain, and then another piece of software and adapter that. Uh, takes the, the opening transactions, the update transactions, and uh, you know turns them into the blockchain's format, and then also um, sort of uh, puts like distributes them to the gossip network or puts them into the blockchain, whatever way you're supposed to do that. Um, and then they're still talking with update transactions with the counterparty, and so you can have these things chain together. So you can have you know you have a ledger, one ledger that's a bank, one ledger that's a blockchain, uh, these different kind of things. So I'm going to show you an example app now. Um, it's a basic payment channel. It doesn't involve the hash lock, so it doesn't have uh, interledger functionality, but uh, it's written in Node.js and it's, it's very um, quick and easy to grasp. So uh, the state is um, the public key, the, the key is the public key of each, each uh, party, each party of the channel, and the, uh, there's a number, the value of the number which is the balance. Um, so for instance, you have an opening transaction where you each put $100 into escrow. And then the update transactions also the balances, like I showed. Um, so let's uh, switch over to the code. Um, I don't know, let me see, I can probably zoom in a little more. So basically, uh, so my software universal state channels offers a uh, HTTP API. Um, so here we can see this is the CRUD stuff. Um, you have accounts. Accounts are, are basically accounts that you have with various uh, ledgers. You can view those. Um, you can view channels. These are channels that are open and are confirmed by, by ledgers and the counterparties, which are other people or other connectors that you are interacting with. Um, so make a new channel. Uh, take some arguments. Uh, you get a channel ID, which is just some sort of a random, uh, you know, uh, some key. Um, and then you have your public key and the counterparty public key. And uh, then you have some state. And this is what the developer is responsible for determining. That's why I showed up on my slide. Um, and so here we see we have the public keys paired to the balances. And so you submit this. Uh, it then gets sent to your counterparty. They approve it. And then it gets sent to the, whoops, let me show you actually here. So um, new channel. So yeah, the counterparty gets it, and then it goes kind of into a queue, and, and I'm not showing that, but you can see that uh, on the on the, the view channels call. Um, and so when they see it, they see a channel that they want to accept that looks good to them. They can do accept channel, another HTTP call here, and that then sends it to the um, the ledger after it's been accepted. So it signs it and sends it to the ledger. And the cancellation is just to cancel a channel before there are any update transactions. Um, otherwise, there would be no way to cancel it. Um, and then to make a payment, you first uh, you get the channel, get some information about it. Um, you use the channel ID to get the channel. Uh, we have the channel here, um, and you get the state of the last. There's a there's a there's an element in the channel called last full update transaction. Oh, it's a typo here. I wrote it wrong, but last full update TX. Um, and so you either use that with, with those balances or you use um, this opening TX, which is the initial balances. Um, and so then we also had this, uh, we had this amount here. And uh, here we, uh, we subtract the amount from, um, from their, their balance in the state and we add it, or we subtract from ours and add to theirs. Uh, we check that you know, the, the user didn't submit too much of an amount, uh, so they go below zero or whatever. Um, and then so to, to accept the payment, basically have this, uh, this check, balance, uh, check balance call. And um, so here you're getting, uh, let's see, you're getting the state of the last full update transaction. Um, Yeah, so you're either using, you know, you're just checking your balances. And so if there is a proposed update transaction, 
um, you then do some checks on it. So you, know, you get the difference in balances, um, and you have various reasons to reject them or to, uh, so it can't look, go below zero, and it's raised and lowered by the same amount, uh, just to keep things um, you know, valid. Um, and then also your my balance must be higher than it was before. So you don't want a payment that actually lowers your balance. It's not a payment. Um, and so yeah, then it outputs the balances. Um, and then the closed channel, check channel needs to be called at least once per pay per whole period for event sheeting. Um, so I don't know, that might have been a little bit um, that might have been a little bit too fast to explain that code, but um, that's the concept and that's what I'm working on right now. So 